the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Welcome today, Dr. Silverberg. Dr. Silverberg's a radiologist out of Charlotte, and he recently gave a talk at our Charlotte meeting about trauma imaging. I'm so excited to have him on the podcast today. Just for a point of reference, there will be some images posted on our YouTube channel. So when you're listening to the podcast, if you'd like to see some images that kind of correlate to the topics we're discussing, please tune into that. So Dr. Silverberg, welcome. Appreciate the opportunity. You talked some about osseous pathology and the Wolf Law and mechanostat theory, and I, I don't want to go down that too far, but you have a very nice slide on that that kind of explains what it means. Would you mind going through that a little bit and just telling our listeners what's meant by the Wolf Law and mechanostat theory and how that's relevant for osseous pathology? Sure. And I feel like, uh, you know, I will do my best to keep this brief, but uh, I feel like I'll do a disservice to to Wolf and uh, the other physician that came up with mechanostat by summarizing. But essentially, you know, there's a, there's a saying that we never treat an image, we treat a patient. And I think when we look at images, we have to take a step back and realize, you know, this, this is a patient, it's not just pictures, right? So understanding things like Wolf's Law and how it applies to imaging is same with mechanostat and how it applies to imaging really helps us to understand the significance of what we're actually seeing on that image. So Wolf's Law and Bone, to summarize, is just a law of theory created by a surgeon just explaining how bones respond to stress. So for example, if we look at the upper extremity in a you know, right-hand dominant professional tennis player and compare that to their contralateral side, it's very common that dominant hand that they use the racket in is going to have thicker bones than a non-dominant side. Well, why is that? It's basically a result of that bone reinforcing itself. It becomes thicker because thicker bones are less prone to fracture and stress-related injuries. So it's the bone that is kind of changing in response to stress. And that's basically what Wolf's Law says. You know, the, the mechanostat theory kind of improved upon that because Wolf's Law is not perfect, a perfect description. And mechanostat theory is kind of seen as Wolf's Law version two, essentially. And it better describes how bones model and remodel. What we mean by that is uh, remodeling is a normal function. Bones, re all, all of our bones remodel. Just, you know, an average year, I believe, I think it's 10% or less or maybe 50% or less of our bones that remodel just in response to our normal daily activities, kind of taking out the old bone and putting in the new. Or if we have an area of bone that's being exposed to more stress, more bone is, is deposed in that area and less bone is deposed in a different area. And it's just a way of changing the makeup of the bone. It's not changing what the bone is made of. It's changing the distribution of the components of the bone to support or scaffold, essentially, areas that are placed under more stress. And so that's important in patients that don't weight bear. And we get osteopenia, right? Because they're taking bone away from areas and putting it in places that would benefit from using more bone. So if someone's not weight bearing in the lower extremity, that bone is not being utilized. It's going to be remodeled and bones can be taken away. In the opposite end of the spectrum, if someone is constantly, you know, exposing a bone to higher stress, let's say a runner, you know, in the calcaneus or something like that, um, or metatarsals they're going to need a little bit more bone to pose because they're exposed to more stress. So this is really important to kind of understand because when we look at images, we're seeing that in action. We're seeing these bones remodel and that could be pathologic or it could be physiologic. And that's kind of what we need to, to suss out. So a great example of this, and I think an example that is relevant to kind of so many paths in orthopedics is medial tibial stress syndrome because it's a spectrum of uh, pathology. It starts when the muscle and bone interface is overloaded along the tibial periosteum, and then it can progress all the way to a cortical fracture. So there's a classification or grading system in use called the Fredrickson classification system. I'm not sure you know, if you guys use that. I don't really harp on classification systems, but I think it's just a good example of literally every spectrum of kind of stress response or the mechanostat theory in action. In the lowest grade of medial tibial stress or shin splints, it's due to attraction periostitis, where that tibialis anterior tugging at the interface of the attachment of bone to the anterior tibial cortex, and it's overloading the tibial periosteum. It's tugging, tugging, tugging. So in the early stage, the only manifestation on imaging is just a little bit of periosteal fluid. So on a fluid-sensitive sequence, we see this little bright signal that goes along the anterior cortex tibia, and that's literally it. That's the only finding. So if we take a step back and we look at that, you know, most people say, oh, little bit of fluid, it could be nonspecific. But again, putting it in the context of the mechanostat theory, that bone is remodeling. That, that, we're, we, that tiny little fluid, that little subtle finding is telling us 
that bone is being exposed to a higher degree of stress than it can handle. And the remodeling process may begin. Now, we take that patient, give them rest, let them recover, and then they go back. That remodeling is over. Now that bone, that periosteal and muscle interface can withstand higher stress. So that's why shin splints get better, right? Because the patients remodel. Now, let's say that patient doesn't rest and they keep going and they keep running. They're exposing now that bone to a chronic repetitive stress at a higher and higher degree. And eventually that will lead to a fracture. So what we see on imaging is we get that little bit of fluid around the cortex. It continues to, to progress. They get marrow edema within the medullary cavity. Again, on a fluid sensitive sequence, edema is bright. It's going to be bright signal in the medullary cavity usually starts along the end of ostium. Once it gets worse, it goes through the entire medullary cavity. And if we keep let you know keep going and we don't kind of uh, intervene clinically, that then will be transmitted to the cortex and we've got a cortical fraction. A fraction will be bright signal on a fluid sense sequence in normal dark cortical bone. So uh, that I think that's just kind of a, a great spectrum of pathology that encompasses the mechanostat, you know, in in one nice package is that you see every spectrum. If bones are overloaded, they are going to response, they are going to remodel. And it's important for us, just me as an imager, uh, as a muscular radiologist, to say, that bone is telling me something. This is at risk for an injury, and we want to catch it early. So the reason it's important to understand things like Wolf's Law Mechanistat is to think about, well, you know, what is this, what is this image telling us in terms of the pathophysiology and the histology of bone. And just that little fluid, that tiny little fluid along the intercourse of the tibia in that setting tells us. This is a setup for a stress fracture. And again, you know, most of these patients come in and it's obvious, but these subtle patients are really ones we want to pick up because we can help prevent things progress to that fracture state. Got it. And that's a great explanation of some complicated theories. Uh, we will have this on our YouTube channel. Like I said earlier, Dr. Silverberg's slide that explains it. So refer to that often. I, I do want to ask you something that I didn't put on the script just out of curiosity. Sure. Let's say you, and common things occur commonly, you know, you see a fracture on a radiograph, you know, it's the same. I'm sure there's, you know, similar findings with MRI. But if you see something that's suspicious, is there a way to measure the density of that material or that anatomy and compare it to something else that would say, oh, this is not good. This is more likely this, or, you know, uh, even with bone, like you were talking about the tibia stress fractures, the osteopenia, can you measure the density of it or kind of get a... Uh, I, I, I think in CT, it was called a region of interest where you could measure it and, you know, compare it to other anatomy and kind of get an idea. Is that ever something that you would use? It's a great question. And I can tell you were a CT tech in the past. <laughs> Essentially, we can't measure density because the physics work differently, unfortunately. But there are some things we can use. And so, you know, I guess one other question is, is are, are you looking to say, is this a pathologic fracture, regular fracture, or is there something else in bone, like, is this an infiltrative process rather than marrow edema? Is, is that sort of the root of the question? Exactly. And yeah. and that, and if we take that a step further, you know, we get the MRI and it comes back and it says, well, it might be this, it might be that for their imaging. And, and I'm just trying to help our listeners understand why you can't always use this modality and say, that's what it is. We need another modality to kind of better define it. Gotcha. Yep. So going back to soft tissue contrast, because I think this plays a role in our ability to diagnose. When we talked about sequences, I'm, I'm saying, you know, this thing is bright on T1 or it's dark on T2. My bright might be different than your bright. So when I say something is bright, you may say, ah, you know, it's intermediate. It's kind of mildly bright. I don't agree with you saying it's very bright. So we need a we need a reference, and our reference in musculoskeletal imaging is always skeletal muscle. So if I say something is bright, I always mean it's bright relative to skeletal muscle. And if I said something's dark, you know it's dark relative to skeletal muscle. And the reason that's that's relevant, that soft tissue contrast is relevant to to this concept of of bone pathology is we have a very fortunate soft tissue contrast difference in bone. We have cortical bone which is dark. We have medullary bone, which is bright because of the medullary fat that exists. Fractures and contusions, well, we'll get into contusions in a bit. Fractures disrupt the trabeculae within medullary fat. So we see a nice clean path of that disruption as a fracture line. Bone contusions are microtrabecular fractures, meaning they're little tiny areas of the trabeculated fracture, but they don't coalesce. They don't form one dominant fracture line. They're sort of separated out in space, right? So they're they're technically microtrabecular fractures, but we don't call them fractures. So they're not forming one big fracture line. But 
In both of those scenarios, the medullary fat that's disrupted is disrupted by a fracture. In tumors or infiltrative lesions, they don't respect the boundaries of medullary fat. They replace it, right? They're destroying bone. They don't care about going along the path of least resistance that a fracture line takes. They'll go anywhere. So when we look at medullary fat, it's very important to, to, to look at a non-fat saturated image because that fat helps us to determine whether or not it's replaced or destroyed. Take a tumor, for example, or take lymphoma or anything that infiltrates bone, even osteomyelitis. That is going to replace and destroy medullary fat. And the way that looks on MRI is dark. It's going to be dark, right? Because it's, it's this infiltrative process replacing bright fat. And if the fat's replaced, it's no longer going to be bright because it's not there anymore. So one thing other than density that we can use is the signal intensity. So typically, contusions are going to be either occult, meaning we can't see it because it's going to be bright, or they're going to be brighter than muscle on a T1 non-fat saturated image. Fracture lines are typically darker than a muscle on a T1 and image. However, a fractional like I mentioned is going to be linear and well-formed. If we see something that is darker than muscle and is not a fracture line on a T1 weighted image, that gives us pause because that says that marrow fat is potentially being replaced and might be a tumor. If we see a cortical fracture line, it's nice and distinct, it's game over. That's a fracture. We're done. Most Tumors that cause cortical disruption don't do it along clean planes, right? It's not, again, it's not going along the path of least resistance. That's a tumor eating away or, or kind of breaking out of its cortical shell and not going along a finite path. So to answer your question kind of uh, succinctly, we don't use density, but we use marrow replacement and we use the soft tissue contrast created by that T1 bright fat being replaced as our kind of equivalent. There are also some more technical things we can do. And I'll just mention this briefly just so people are aware of it, but this kind of gets a little bit more complex. There's something called opposed phase imaging. And opposed phase imaging basically just looks for medullary fat. So if I have a, a case, let's say I, I see this patient, they come in, they had mild trauma that doesn't really fit a contusion, but there's something, you know, it kind of looks like a contusion. And I can't tell, is that medullary fat preserved or not? You know, it, it technically should be brighter than muscle or a cult on a T1, but there's something that's kind of, you know, it's close. It's close to muscle. We can do what's called a post phase imaging, and basically it looks for microscopic fat. And if there's microscopic fat in an area that we're considering as a tumor, it's unlikely to be a tumor because, again, tumors replace that fat. So that's the best equivalent we have compared to CT density is that is the medullary fat being replaced and destroyed? And if so, it should be darker than skeletal muscle it should be ill-defined and not forming a fracture line. And that's that's the best equivalent we have compared to CT. Great. That's awesome. Awesome description of why you get the reports, what it means when you get the reports. Some of the terminology is right on spot. I mean, it just helps you to understand what's going on by knowing the background in this. Dr. Silverberg, thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you guys. And I really appreciate it. Listeners, follow along on our YouTube channel. Um, we'll have several images of Dr. Silverberg's talk that correlate with the podcast. So please follow along there. And for our listeners that uh, would like to see Dr. Silverberg's presentation at our conference, again, it'll be on our website soon. Our annual meeting this year is called Ortho and Indy. It's from August 21st through August 25th. The venue is the JW Marriott. Not only do we have world-class speakers, we have workshops, optional mini sessions, food, social events. There's just tons of